So, without further ado, this is Mrs. Miriam Pratt. She's been a lifelong resident of Hadley, and she's been a librarian in the North Hadley branch of the North Hadley Library since 1964. And here we go. <laughs> Well, here we go, is right. <laughs> I am overwhelmed. That seems such a nice, nice crowd. And I thank the members of the Historical Society who are here uh, for their March meeting, too. And uh, yes, I did go all eighth grades here. I should know the building. And I certainly do, with all its changes. I'm, I'm going to start uh, way back, way, way, way back. I bet nobody in this room knows what the name of North Hadley was uh, in, 16, in the 1600s. That's one of the names, but that's not the first name. <laughs> Yes, she says had the upper mills. Yes, that is the third name. The first two names were were Mill uh, <coughs> Mill uh, School Meadows and Mill River. You know, the Mill River, of course, is what is now the North Hadley Pond, uh, and uh, the Mill River was a rushing stream, and School Meadows was down, you know, where the red rocks are, down on the Connecticut River? Uh, some of you do, I know. Uh, and, and that section down there was called School Meadows. Why it was called School Meadows is way back in the time of uh, the Hopkins Fund, when it started in 1670 or 1680, and it was, it was given by, by Edward Hopkins to give, some, to give some encouragement in those foreign plantations for the benefit of hopeful youth. And you know that, that was the start of Hopkins Academy. And so, uh, one of the trustees of, of the old, old, old Hopkins in 1670, uh, invested a portion of this Hopkins Fund in land down in the school meadows uh, in North Hadley here, and also to build a mill on the Mill River. So uh, the Mill River was a rushing stream in those days. You can tell by the by the banks that are down uh, below where the mill is, was now. Uh, and from here down to the Connecticut River, there are really steep banks. So it was a great place for a mill. And so that's where Hopkins got its first uh, money around here as an investment. I thought that was interesting because I know 95% of you probably graduated from Hopkins, as I did. <clears throat> so uh, what has that to do with North Hadley? Well, it's right, right down here where, if you know the lay of the land down here, <clears throat> uh, the, the mill lot included the uh, all up to just about here from the, from the water. Where they're, where they're making the new bridge right now. That's where the mills were. <clears throat> Only the first one was 30, 30 uh, rods upstream from, from where it is now, where the, where the, uh, where it is now. <clears throat> So there weren't any houses up here. It was, uh, it was all, of course, it was all woods, except down on the meadow, where it was nice, 
grass and where the Indians always planted corn. Uh, I'm not sure who won out finally there, uh, the Indians or, or the, uh, but I know there was a mortgage on the, on the land for a while down in that area. So the mill was built in 1662. It had an overshot wheel and it, it was a grist mill, of course. Uh, Hadley didn't have any other grist mill. Uh, they had, <clears throat> their mill was over in Hatfield and they had to go from the center over to across the river and, and get, uh, get their corn ground or their wheat ground or their rye. And, and, and the, uh, and the, well, anyway, in 1667, it was finally burned by the Indians. <laughs> I've had a cold and, and my voice isn't the best. And it was, uh, the mill in 1667 was burned by the Indians at the same, on the same day as they uh, attacked Hatfield. And can, can't you imagine that they, in one of their canoes, came across the river from Hatfield and came up the entrance to the Mill River down here in North Hadley? and came right up and burned the mill. I can imagine that's exactly the, the way they came here because the rest of the place was, was all uh, woods. <clears throat> and that mill was swept away by, the, by floods in 1692 and 1706 and 1727. And each one they rebuilt it each time. Uh, and then, by 1770, it was called Hadley Upper Mills. You're right. <laughs> uh, Hadley up Upper Mills. The lower mills were down in Hadley on uh, Bay Road and down that way. But this was Upper Mills. And it was not only the mills here, but later on, it was the mill over in, uh, well, Everybody knows where the Pecalas used to live over uh, <coughs> near North Maple Street uh, and near Three Corners. That's where the other mill was in, later on, though. So uh, there, it was a slow start of places around here. And <coughs> the, the one, uh, There were only 17 houses up here in 1797, and only three families here in 1731, so it was a really slow start of getting s settled up here. People would make little uh, summer shacks and small houses. Uh, the people that leased the land down, on the, down in the meadows would build little houses but they wouldn't stay in the winter and uh, they couldn't be counted as uh, residents. But then there was great expansion. In 1830, 1840, and 1850, and that's when a lot of people uh, built houses, especially here on the main street. Uh, almost all those houses are 1850, 40, and up on the hill, the oldest house most people know is, is the one opposite on the other side of the street from, from mine in, in, uh, on Mount Warner Road, uh, belonging to the young boys for it's now. Uh, that's the oldest house in town, seven, in, in North Hadley, in, in 1785. That was built.
and it wasn't called North Hadley until 1837. So now we can say it's North Hadley. Of course, we're still part of the town of Hadley. You have to admit that. <laughs> And of course, the, the famous part of, of uh, the old North Hadley was, was the mill. There was a lumber mill right down here, which was uh, very, they cut the lumber off almost the whole of Mount Warner, and they uh, got lumber over in the Great Swamp, which is across the mountain from here, uh, over in Plainville. The Great Swamp was, was they had a, uh, uh, permission uh, to, to cut, uh, to cut pine and white oak over in the, over in that, uh, in that area. So there was a lumber mill, and there was a flax carding mill, and there was a piano wire mill, and, uh, and a, of course, the grist mill was the first one, and the lumber mill was the second one, and the, uh, and the, uh, the lumber went down the river on rafts and flatboats, and the the soap mill was on another dam that was further down toward the Connecticut River from from the dam that was up here. And that lower dam had the soap mill on it. The blacksmith shop was where the boathouse is down by the bridge where there working so hard now. And the tavern, that was an important part of this town up here. Uh, and the bar room was on the southeast corner of the house that, that is still there. Uh, and that is down here on River Drive. Uh, did you, do you know where Glen Clark lives? The house just this north side of his house was the T. Smith Tavern. And it was a very important part of this area. And then came the broom shops. And that's another whole talk about them, because there were loads of them in, in town. and. At one time, they got 20 uh, men to come down from Canada and work in the, in the broom shops. And by, 17, uh, by 1870, that was the time when tobacco started around here, 1870, 1880. And that's when the, the broom manufacturing went out. There were a lot of small uh, manufacturing places in, in the woodsheds and in the back little rooms of so many people's houses around here. And then there was Mr. Arthur Howe's broom, uh, broom shop. Uh, he made uh, broom knives and he still still was making them when I moved here, uh, when I moved up to the house I'm in in 1949. Um, he was still making knives. In fact, he made them until he died in, in uh, 1960, 1960, I think it was. He was still making knives in that little shop. And any of us who have any of his little paring knives I think we're very fortunate because they're, they're such good uh, material and never wear out. 
if you don't lose them. <laughs> so, where are we with the schools, you're thinking, right? Well, not much is really known about the first schools, but um, there were little dame schools that, that meant uh, that one woman in, in her own home would have some children come in to teach them the three R's and the simple, simple arithmetic and simple reading and so forth. All the women were supposed to teach their uh, children to read the Bible and to, 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 to learn the little jingles. And this is one of them. He who ne'er, he who ne'er learns his ABC, the idle fool is, no. He who ne'er learns his ABC, forever will a blockhead be. <laughs> and the idle, the idle fool is whipped at school. <laughs> that wouldn't be so funny. Uh, and so the first, the first school was down uh, in what is now a vacant lot just south of where Glenn Clark lives down here on uh, River Drive. Uh, and it was a one-room school and the, uh, the, it was arranged in tiers. The smaller children were on the bottom tier. The, the uh, medium-sized children were on the second tier, and the older kids were on the third uh, top tier. And the teacher was on the other you know, side, facing them on a little platform. If you can imagine how that looked in a, in a little one-room thing. Uh, and they just learned the, the basic uh, things there. And then the second uh, the second one that we know about uh, was down here on the edge of the pond, uh, just north of the Babs house, which is the other side of the church. And you know, the, uh, there's a place that goes down, and then the West Kevitz house is up there next to it. And where the West Kevitzes uh, had their garden, uh, was where this school was. And that was a, a, a two-room school with a, with a little uh, hall upstairs. And so that was real fancy for its day. It was built in 1826. It's, it's this picture. It's on the, on the board up there. Uh, built in 1826, and when, when this building was built in 18, um, now I forget when it was built. When this building was built, um, that building was sold, uh, and it was taken across the street and down here on Meadow Street, uh, and put behind the behind the uh, behind the house that is opposite is is opposite the church. It's just right down here on the first part of Meadow Street, and that school was uh, put there for a while. When it when it was still up here, it. It had, after it was a school, it became a store, and you can tell in the picture that it has two large windows, store windows, when it was a store. Well, then it was here on Meadow Street, and uh, then they had a fire in the house in front of it and, it, and it burned up the old school, which by that time had been used as a, uh, storehouse for hay and things like that. So that was the end of that building. 
and that was in 1920-something. <clears throat> I just vaguely remember that when it was on Meadow Street. So it must have been early 20s. I've got loads of notes here. <laughs> well, anyway, of course, this this building was built in 1864 and dedicated in January 1865. Of course, that was right during the Civil War, and I don't know why exactly um, we could build uh, a big school like this then. Um, but when it, by the time, by the time I went to school, there were 115 children. When I was in the first grade, there were 115 children going to the school in, in all eighth grade, all eight grades, and coming up here to this hall for uh, all kinds of, of uh, programs and speaking and singing and concerts and so forth. This, uh, when it was built, uh, it was built for a school, of course, and and the North Hadley people wanted it very much to have uh, a social place, which which this room is, uh, and then it, it got too small, almost right away, for the number of children, and in 1861. They built the addition onto it, which, which is the, uh, which now is the fire house underneath. Uh, they wanted a social place where they could entertain, and so there is a kitchen. The kitchen is still out there, on the second floor, right out here. Uh, and in 1902, the uh, library. Uh, the North Hadley Library uh, became a town library and was in the back part of the L over here on the second floor. And, and in 1954, that's, that's the, the year I started being librarian there. Uh, and it was in 1954 that this, this school was closed and had to and the children had to go down to the center in, in buses from here. <coughs> we had a, a fine lot of uh, people and groups who, uh, who used this school and hall There were, there were three, three rooms. The first and second grade were in the, where the library is in the rear room downstairs. Uh, I have a interesting, interesting to me anyway. Uh, when my mother uh, came to this town, she had come from Marlboro and she was, had graduated from normal school in Framingham, and this was her first job up here in North Hadley. And so she came and taught the first and second grade in the, in the room, which is now the library that I uh, enjoy. <laughs> uh, and uh, so she, she taught 19, 
six, seven, and 196, 197, 198, I think, or 199, because she was married in 1910 to my father, who was a local person here. Uh, and uh, so that is what I, I think is, is interesting about that place. Uh, the third and fourth grade and fifth were here where the park and rec has their, uh, has their office downstairs. And the grammar room was over <coughs> where the firehouse is. When the firehouse was built, if you, if you look at the snapshots that I took way back in 19, uh, what year was it, 72, uh, when, when the firehouse was built, uh, they, they had to take the floor off and fill up the basement part uh, with gravel and, and dirt and so forth because the fire engines were too, too heavy for any regular school floor. And so that was, uh, and then they had to add on something to uh, a shed dorma onto the front. Uh, because the fire engines were too long to get into the place. So uh, that has been the fire house ever since. And why there is a, why there is a second floor to the addition, which was in 1871, um, uh, the North Hadley people said that they they would uh, pay for uh, the town wanted to have it uh, a one-story addition, uh, but uh, the North Hadley people wanted to have uh, a better place to entertain in and more room and so forth. So, uh, so the lumber was. So the man who had the, the um, lumber mill said he would give the lumber if they let us up here have, have a second floor on that addition. And so it, it was built with that in mind. And there were all kinds of lyceums and entertainments and, and public suppers and dances and strawberry festivals. and. And also here, there were uh, the church services uh, was a mission uh, service for for the the French and the Irish Catholics uh, who didn't have a church except uh, going to Amherst, and most of them wanted to have a, a service right here. Uh, so first were the Irish and the French Catholics, and then the Polish Catholics came, and I, I remember when they had their services up here, not really too many years ago. Uh, the, first, uh, the first Polish family was the Sibelski family in 1890 and they lived on uh, French Street. French Street is named that because of those 20 French people that came, uh, men that came down from Canada to work in the mills. Uh, and, the, and those houses that are there on French Street now uh, were built to house those, uh, those people and Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Katie Bach uh, was of Meadow Street, was one of the first Polish people here in North Adley. And they also had weekly dances here, uh, round or square, 
uh, for the benefit of, of this hall uh, or the engine house. The engine house was, that is the fire engine, uh, was uh, up on Mount Warner Road, just up past the mill on, uh, on the right side. You can see the, the uh, cellar hole where it used to be. Uh, and, and that's where hook and ladder number five, which is the local North Hadley uh, group, uh, <laughs> had their horse-drawn pump up there with its uh, leather buckets hanging on the sides. And, and their sign, the hook and ladder, number five, was on the side of the building. Of course, it burned down, I don't know, long ago. So what, what about the teaching? somewhere. Anyway, in, in 19, I have the, the report for 1922, that's the year I started school, and this is the school report from, for Hadley and Hatfield. We had the same superintendent, and so they had the same uh, report book, and this is 1922, and see how different it is. Punishment is largely left to the discretion of the individual teacher. It should fit the offense. Uh, corporal punishment should be used only as a last resort. <laughs> and I can remember uh, I, uh, when I was in the grammar room, that was fifth, sixth, seventh, fifth grade sometimes was in this room and sometimes was in the grammar room. I was in the fifth and the grammar room and uh, corporal punishment. Uh, Mrs. Caroline T. Scott was the, was the teacher then for long years and she was, she was very strict, very firm, uh, but, uh, but fair and firm you might say. Uh, and so if you did, I don't, I don't remember what I did, but uh, <laughs> I think it was three, three or four of us girls did some mischief, I suppose. And um, she had what they called a rubber hose. It was a, it was a rubber hose, just about so long. And uh, so we had to put out our hands and she would give us a good lick with that, with that rubber hose. Of course, she used it on some of the, some of the acting out boys much harder than she did on our little palms when we had them out. But so think of how, how different it is today. And they had devotional exercises every morning reading some portion of the Bible and the Lord's Prayer, and singing in memory gems may follow, together with a salute to the flag. We salute the flag every, every morning. The pledge shall be given at least once each week, and may be given daily. Well, we had it daily. So that's different, too. I have that that school, this one that I showed you the picture of, cost uh, two hundred and thirty five dollars to build <laughs> back in eighteen. 
Breathing time. Well, uh, there were a lot of different groups that, that used this uh, room here. Uh, and met here for their meetings or had events and open to the public. And that was, uh, were 4 H clubs and the Boy Scout troops. I got a phone call from somebody who had been a Boy Scout. I got a phone call just Sunday uh, from somebody who had been a Boy Scout here four years. And uh, his uh, leader had been uh, uh, Mr. Stan, who was a teacher at uh, Hopkins, who, who I had as a teacher when he started teaching, and I guess I was a senior. Uh, and I got a phone call tonight from somebody who was uh, from Helen Zaturka. Does anybody remember her? Uh, and she couldn't come tonight, but she wanted me to know that she was thinking of me. And I have a picture of her and me when we were uh, both in the PTA, which was very, which was very uh, uh, important uh, group here at the time. And the United Sportsmen always met here. And the Mothers Club, the Mothers Club made made the drapes that that we used to have down in the park and rec. Uh, room when it was our meeting room. We call it the club room, and all these clubs met down in that room, which, which is a good size room. Uh, and the mothers' club, uh, they made the drapes, and the brownies and cubs had groups here, and uh, and they always had their fly-ups and. Uh, not graduations, but uh, all the Boy Scout troops and the, and the Girl Scout troops and the 4 H clubs and the PTA. Our PTA was active from 1950 to the end of 1954 when, when it was, when this school was. And I I was secretary of the PTA for a while, and I was president when we when we ended. Uh, and I have the book, and that's on display over there on the table somewhere. Uh, the four years that we had the group, we didn't uh, we didn't stop at the end. We said that we would uh, start a PTA in Hadley where our kids were going. And so that's what we did. And I know the, the PT, what do you call them, not PTA. We were, we were a member of the, of the local, state, and national PTA. Uh, and I know the organization they have now, parent-teacher organization, uh, isn't uh, isn't allied with the uh, bigger groups. And the hook and ladder number five had their meetings here too. Uh, I think some of some of those people are here tonight. And I know some of the uh, PTA people are here tonight. And I guess some of the Mothers Club. And you, we always used to have eighth grade graduations in this, on this stage where I'm sitting. Uh, I graduated from, from eighth grade and we had nice great big diplomas. Uh, and I also got a, a nice certificate from Palmer Method. Palmer Method, <laughs> Palmer Method in writing. So you can tell who, who is somewhere near my age if they're using Palmer Method. 
and uh, Memorial Day exercises were always up here. Uh, we always, you uh, did a lot for Memorial Day in those days because some of the Civil War veterans were still alive. And uh, in fact, my grandfather, uh, Clement Russell, was still alive and he would, he would uh, speak at the Memorial Day exercise. He had, he had been in 17 battles, and he would tell us something about the battles, and uh, not so much about the battles as about the, the life in the camp and, uh, and the other people in the, who came from different places, uh, and the personal kind of stories. Occasionally, our historical society uh, came here, too. Uh, I remember talking about the history, I think, way back then, 1950-something, a few years ago. <laughs> and the junior band, uh, they always had their rehearsals up here. Everybody from Hadley had to come up to North Hadley for a change. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and we always had the junior band up here. Both my children had been in the junior, were uh, in the junior band, uh, which I think started in 1950. Uh, and I got a nice phone call from from uh, Helen Martula, some of you remember her. Uh, and uh, yesterday, uh, yeah, yesterday. And, um, and she said that, that her daughter, Susan, was in that, was in that first year uh, band. Uh, Mr. Farnham was the director. And uh, some of you remember him. He, he was a great uh, director. And uh, her daughter Susan was in the band, and all the girls had to wear white blouses and dark skirts, and the boys had to wear white sh shirts and, I don't know, uh, dark pants, I suppose. And I read in the, um, I have a program uh, of, of one of the, uh, <coughs> one of the concerts that they gave up here. And, and, the, and this place was filled with people just like it is tonight, uh, overflow crowd, uh, to hear the junior band. And that was their first concert that they, uh, the first year they had a concert is when uh, Susan, uh, Martula was in the band, and then later on, when her when her younger brother was in the band, uh, he he played the trumpet, and there were three of them who got uh, who soloed uh, in with their trumpets in the junior band. Now that's something, because these these kids were only well, you know, ten. Nine, eight. Uh, so that's something, and one of them is here tonight. <laughs> and uh, and also a Tchaikovsky boy, and uh, who's the other one? So there were a lot of events uh, and bef that, that I remember. I mean, these are all things I remember uh, because I was always in the library downstairs and a lot of these things were, were going on. Of course, I only worked very part-time, but uh, uh, after, after this uh, room downstairs was 
was what we call the club room. A lot of those groups would be, uh, would be going when I was down in the next room in the library. Uh, after the school moved out, uh, the library moved from this upstairs room in the back where it had been from 1902. We moved downstairs to the, to the library room where it is now in the back, first floor. Uh, and imagine taking about 5,000 books hand over hand. Uh, there were a group of us volunteers that were doing it. Uh, hand over hand, down the stairs, uh, the back stairs that is, down into the library where the stairs end down that, that way. Uh, imagine taking all those books hand over hand. We would be on the stairs, you know. So hand over hand, we would, <laughs> we would give those books down the stairs in between. The men would take the uh, the uh, shelves down and put them in place so we could, so the books could be placed in the proper order on the shelves. That, I think I'll never forget that. It was a major, major thing, to me anyway. Oh, the bell. There used to be a bell in the belfry up here. And uh, it, uh, the principal of the school, uh, Mrs. Scott, would ring, uh, she would ring it or have one of the boys ring it. Uh, at nine o'clock in the morning for school, uh, and at one o'clock for us to come back from lunch. We all had to go home for lunch, uh, if we could. And lunch was a whole hour, from 12 to 1. Uh, I lived half a mile up the road, uh, and half a mile back, of course. Uh, and everybody went home for lunch, because we were all around here. Uh, there were nine schools in different parts of town. And the idea was to have them near enough so you could, you could be going home for school. Uh, there, was, there were schools in on, uh, West Street and Middle Street and Bay Road and Hartsbrook and Hockenham and uh, Plainville and Roosevelt Street and Russellville. And m most of them, or half of them anyway, were one-room schools. And a uh, few of them were two-room schools. And this was by far the biggest school with three rooms and over 100 kids. Uh, so the bell. Uh, it was, of course, up in the belfry. And the rope hung down, uh, down through the second floor, uh, down through, through the hall out here, uh, down to the first floor in, in the hall. That's where they would bring it from. And of course, sometimes the boys had, had a great, great fun with it when, it when they weren't supposed to be playing. <laughs> when they're supposed to be out playing for recess. <laughs> oh, and the, the principal always ra rang when we had recess, which we did every morning. Uh, the girls had to stay on that side of the, of the outside, and it was hard dirt. It wasn't uh, paved or anything. It was hard dirt. And we used to play hopscotch. We would draw it in a, with a stick and, and use uh, for the ones 
for the things you threw onto the places in the that you were supposed to go in the hopscotch. Uh, we would do it with a, a little piece of glass. Can you imagine that? We didn't have any <laughs> toys or anything. And so that was hopscotch, and we, we played, this is when I was a little kid, we played the Ring Around the Rosie and those kinds of, of games. Uh, meanwhile, the boys had that side, and they were supposed to stay there and not <laughs> bother off us girls. They could play ball and so forth. Then when we were older, we could, uh, if we, the girls, if we wanted to, we could uh, try our hand at softball. I remember one time uh, I was, I suppose I was in probably seventh grade or so. I was out there at recess, of course, playing softball or trying to, and uh, and I got hit right in in the forehead between my eyes with that softball. It wasn't so soft. <laughs> I found out. Probably what I got for staying on my own. <laughs> oh, the drawing teacher came once a, once a week, and the and the music ta uh, teacher came once a week too. They were uh, they would. Uh, Give the teacher some, give the teacher some help in those two things, and also we had a, a singing teacher who came. Uh, she she would go to each each one of the schools uh, in turn. She was a busy person, I know. A lot of a lot of plays were were put put on in this room and at first it uh, it had a big uh, arch here uh, and and wings on the side that were that were closed in the front so you couldn't see the people changing their costumes and so forth and so forth uh, and <laughs> on both sides. And there was a, a great, huge, I can remember this when I was a little kid, a uh, huge um, curtain on a roller. The roller was made of wood. It was about five inches in diameter. And it was up top. And hanging from it was this painted canvas uh, curtain that you could crank. There was a crank on the side over there. And you could crank it up and had to crank it down by hand. Uh, and this great, huge wooden roller, it was, it was a monstrous thing, but it worked fine. Uh, and that was I, I just remember that when I was a little kid, so it must have been. I'm not sure. I don't think it was here by the time I went to school, or maybe for a little while. See, I started in 1922, so maybe for a little while when I was that age. And the ticket booth for the plays was right out there where the restroom is now. That was the ticket booth, and it had a little hole where you had to put your money, and they would give you your ticket for the play. I've got a couple of, of playbills uh, over there on some one of some place over there uh, that. Uh, came from, one of them was 
56, I think. Uh, and they had really some pretty good plays by the titles, anyway. My grandfather was in one of the plays uh, right after he came back from the Civil War. Well, it was 1867, the play was. And because uh, it says so on the playbill, I'm glad it does. Uh, and he was playing the, uh, he was the cohort of a gambler in the play. And I can't imagine, you know, I knew him as an old man uh, before he died in 1929, I think it was. And uh, I can't imagine him uh, being uh, a gambler. <laughs> And downstairs, where, where the restroom is, downstairs uh, used to be, uh, up until not too many years ago, used to be the uh, place where the town nurse kept the uh, wheelchairs and the walkers and the, all those kinds of things in that small room that is, that is now the restroom downstairs. getting tired of listening. I'm almost through. In 1950, there were 641,120 rooms made in Hadley. Imagine that. 641,000 uh, brooms made in this town and sent all over the world. Hadley was famous and we started making brooms when nobody else was making brooms. Didn't know how to make brooms. Well, then I was in, uh, after the library moved down, after it wasn't a school anymore, uh, and then it, uh, in 1963, uh, the hook and ladder uh, group was, um, it was first organized in 1908, and it was reactivated in 1962. And they fitted out the rear room in, in the back that used to be the library. They fitted that out for their office. And it's, it is still there uh, with all their awards and so forth when they were in the, um, the different uh, meets that they had. And then in 1971, by this time this building was, was really getting run down. Needed paint, needed everything. Uh, and in 1971, uh, the Lions Club, which was a very active group at the time, uh, decided that they were taking on a project, a community uh, project, and modernized the, they were, uh, were going to do one room at a time. So the first one they did was, was the one that the Park and Rec has uh, for their, uh, the third, third, fourth, and fifth grade rooms right down below you. Uh, and they decided that they would spend about 1200 to $1,500 fixing it up. Uh, well, in, in, in the 70s, that was a good bit of money. Uh, and they, they put in the light, lighting like this, 
and put in the toilet facilities downstairs and put siding on the walls and put in a sink and we finished the floors and uh, made it a functional room for groups and that's that's where all those clubs had their meetings at that time after that time and then in 1972 they had this the second part of their project uh, and that was uh, more major because it was up in this large hall and that that's when they put in the toilet facilities and these lights and, the, and the lowered the ceiling three feet at least. Before that, it was a really high ceiling in this room. And, uh, and they put in new piers in the cellar. The, the piers had been uh, brick. And they put in new uh, metal piers and they refinished the floors and did the painting and all for uh, all volunteer most most volunteer except the electrical uh, and so we have a lot of thanks to give to the lions club who who did an awfully lot of work uh, to try to get this building up to uh, what it should be for groups to be in. And then, uh, and then in the spring of 1986, <coughs> well, no, before that, in 1983, uh, the uh, inspector building inspector of Hadley decided that this, the floor of this hall wasn't uh, sound enough to have uh, dances or too, too many people. And so a great huge uh, beam across the middle was taken out. It was, it was about 12 feet square, 12 inches square. Uh, was taken out, the one that went right across the middle, uh, and a new, a new laminated uh, beam was put in. And so the floor had to be uh, taken up for that process. And that was something to see. Uh, you can see in the floor of the place where they stopped taking it up. It's there toward the back. And uh, in the spring of 1986, we had a North Hadley Village Hall Study Committee. Uh, it was formed for the purpose of uh, determining most possible uses for the building and to plan the necessary repairs and improvements and restore the building to be once a vital part of the community. And we got a state grant uh, for an energy audit uh, and put in smoke and fire detectors and crash doors and emergency lighting and handrails on the stairs and all those nice things that you have to have. Uh, and I was on the committee with uh, Kathy Pipsinski. I know Kathy's here tonight. And um, Francis Duda and James Russell and Richard Holden and John Kokoski and Frank Sabawa and uh, Alec Alexander Koulis and myself, and we had lots of meetings and made lots of decisions and used up all the money. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the spring of 1988, uh, we had uh, 
the North Hadley Village Hall Committee was awarded 14875 for a rural design assistance grant from the Mass Council of the Arts and Humanities. Uh, and we were, and they gave it to people who were planning for revitalizing historic buildings. Well, we were, we were that kind of group. So we got a, another grant and uh, did a lot more on the building. And we got new tables and a new 10 burner uh, stove out here in the kitchen and a lot of kitchen equipment and a lot of dishes and so forth. Uh, and we wanted to have social events up here like we had had in the good old days. Um, what else can I say that you would like to hear? Well, since then, it hasn't been all roses, I can tell you. Uh, because uh, of uh, we, uh, the, the town gave, uh, voted to spend 45000 for painting the whole thing. Two coats, nice paint. Uh, and Yet, of course, it was covered with, with old paint. And so that was a no-no for children. So we had to get all the old paint off before, uh, before they could put new paint on here. And it was a bad time because uh, in the process of getting the paint off, uh, the uh, surrounding was made very bad for <clears throat> the public. So the building was closed for quite a while. Of course, that didn't do anything very good for the library, which, which <laughs> was supposed to be open. So that, that's when I got a little publicity for that too. I, I went, uh, I took, I came, I bravely came in myself, even if the public couldn't. I came in and got books and I, I knew my customers uh, from the library pretty well, so I, I would get them some books. and, and uh, and that's the way I circulated books for months and months <laughs> here uh, in North Hadley. So that was a bad time for this building. But finally, of course, uh, it did get painted. And, and, uh, uh, but it was one of those years that the paint wasn't very good, so it still doesn't look very good outside, which I think you probably know. And then the next bad trouble was uh, those pigeons. <laughs> and pigeons got in, I don't know where. <clears throat> we never could find where they got in. They got into the, the attic, the attic above here and the attic above the uh, firehouse. Uh, and so we had to get, supposed to get rid of them. So that took a, a long while and a lot of work. And then, uh, and the people were working up above here and there's not a floor up there, it's, it's just pieces of planks across like that with nothing in between except the ceiling. So out in the hall, 
I don't know exactly how it happened, but anyway, the ceiling came down into the hall. Uh, <laughs> and uh, one of the workmen with it, too. And so the building was closed four months. That was another sort of disaster for the, for the building, because nobody could come in. They, they had really uh, closed the building. So that was disaster number two. But finally, we, we had a new ceiling put in, uh, in there. And so things are going nicely. Knock on wood. <laughs> uh, I, I know there are some people here who, who went to school here and who, uh, and who were in some of those groups. And I think uh, I'd love to have some of you to stand up and, and say what you, uh, what you remember or what you did or something about it. Uh, who would like to start? I'd like to say something. My name is Macholeski. There are ten, there are ten <laughs> Macholeskis that came from North Hadley about 19, my brother Henry was the first. And, and there was a Gallus with there were ten there, and the box of the side, I think, top four, five, four, and so, so, so. Strictly a, a big Polish bunch of people that came. Ours was the biggest house in uh, 1936. We had 13 kids in our class, I remember. <laughs> but anyway, I don't remember in the first grade when I, I was there, uh, they had a five gallon of, of water. <laughs> I guess that's what you drank out of. And you remember where the old house was? Remember where it was? I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it was maybe six feet by eight. It was a small shed with like this, right? And the girls went on one side with the three holes. And I, I, I guess I was coming down. <laughs> <laughs> And the boys had the other side. But uh, no, uh, my, uh, I know there are many things like the bell used to ring at quarter of nine and nine o'clock would come to school and so forth. And uh, my oldest brother came to first grade. Of course, his parents were Polish. My parents were Polish. So he came to the first grade. I'll show you how close the, the uh, teachers were with the kids. And he says in Polish, I don't understand a word of English. So he followed a guy by Stanley Bach to school. Well, they found out later on that when he learned English, he was pretty good. There was 10 kids in the family, so they pushed him. It's, he skipped it. He was 14 years old. He was a junior in high school of it. <laughs> in first grade, he couldn't even talk. <laughs> then, then my sister Agnes, she was in seventh grade, a guy by little Fred Callahan, came to the she wanted to show off a little bit, so she wrote a, uh, a nice essay. She found herself in the eighth grade the next day. <laughs> <laughs> was she your classmate, Mitch? What? She was your classmate, wasn't she? 1934? <coughs> Agnes? Mm -hmm. what, what, yeah, she was your classmate. Right? Yeah. And then my sister Jessie, and, and she was quite a teacher. Matter of fact, we got a couple of valid deterrents out of the house from Miss Scott. She was such a good teacher. God bless her. She was wonderful. But she did a little bit more than that. Uh, we had 4-H, and we had a fellow by the name of Benton P. Cummings, who was a representative for 4-H in Hampshire County. And uh, so she used to buy the lumber for the men. And I remember we made a plant stand and I was so forth, and the girls, she taught the girls to sew. And I learned how to cane chairs. We used to go around to the households, ask anybody if they wanted a chair cane, uh, a chair uh, that one needed caning. So she used to buy the cane, so we, we, did, we used to cane chairs. I can cane, cane chairs today. And she taught the girls how to sew dresses. Right, Mitch? Yeah. <laughs> that's true. And then, uh, so forth, so, that, and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Benton becomes had us on uh, WSPR, that was 1936. Now, radios were hardly out, right? So he, she, he was a 4 H club, he said, well, I gotta have somebody talk over the radio. So uh, Mrs. Scott took the pitch pipe, she gave it to everybody, then she gave it to me, she says, you're it? <laughs> so, I went, because <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> we, that's what they call bendy bowls, if you remember how the ice used to bend. So I, I had the pitch pipe in my pocket, and I went on bending both my, my slip, slipped, and I fell into the ice, and it went across my knees. 
And, and, and I got two black eyes the next day. Ben Cubs says, what happened to you? I got two black eyes and a bloody noise. I'm, I'm on WSBR teaching the girls to sing lullaby again. <laughs> <laughs> but it just goes to show you. Then also, then they had a, uh, uh, had LaSalle's down in Lord Fair there. They had a, a contest of making some kind of a piece of wood. And we won it in North Ham. So Benton P. Cummings took us to Benson Wild Animal Farms as the prize. So it just goes to show you what Mrs. Scott used to do for us. Not only that, but she, she, she was such a beautiful person that I often wanted to mention this. And I thought a lot of times there was something that should have been left in her honor, with her name on it, because she came back in about 1920, maybe a little less, to teach school. And she was no more than four foot eight, four foot nine, you know, but she, she taught school, you know, and, and she was a good teacher. Well, I, I saw one kid get a whole thing, well, that was the first grade, or second grade, and he misbehaved, so she called Mrs. Scott, she came in and gave her a whole thing. Well, in the third grade, I got a whole thing myself, but it was from Melina White. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the third grade, but in the fifth, sixth grade, then third, and then fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, she gave me the back seat of the thing, and she used to roll her eyes at me. <laughs> when I graduated from sixth grade, I couldn't write, but she put excellent right across the whole thing. <laughs> That wasn't that bad, right? <laughs> no, and, and of course, the other thing was the library before you came was Mrs. Hibbert had it. You remember? She was the librarian at that time. And I went upstairs to the library. I said, see, you didn't have any radios or nothing like that. So we used to go to the library to pick up a book to read. So we read Zane Graves' books, the Rover Boys' books, and then I think I was in the third or fourth grade. Uh, and I'm surprised they had it in North Hadley, but they had Uncle Tom Scabbard. It was a 509-page book from the North Hadley Library. I said, I'll show them that I can read it. So I read it. <laughs> but I had to make a report when I was a junior in high school. Larry made, made a report about a dream about Uncle Tom Scabbard. Mrs. Reed liked it so much. She said, I want to rewrite it for you and have you have it in price week. And I said, I don't want no problem. <laughs> But anyway, that's the, that was the library that was in North Hadley. Then. People used to read a, a lot because there was no such thing as this. Thanks. Well, thanks for listening anyway. But... <laughs> Is, is there anybody here who uh, used to come here for church? I know, uh, and would you like to say something about it? Well, I'll say it as much as the, the Polish had church at 9 and the Irish had it at 10. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I remember about it is the big white altar that used to be up here on the stage, and it was on rollers. and. Uh, they would roll it into the middle here for church service and then roll them into the wings, the wings over there, uh, during the week because we had to use it for other things. Uh, that's the only thing I remember. Who remembers something else? Well, I used to come here every, I went to school to Russell, which is about a mile and a half down the road. But I used to come here every Sunday, and believe it or not, I was an altar boy. <laughs> Father Ferris was our pastor. And the men sat on this side, the women on that side. Yeah. And the boys over there, Big Bill Welsh used to be in the back. And when you got older, you could stand in the back. And oh, you always wanted to grow up so you could stand in the back. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. And I don't know, Charlie Kulikowski was an altar boy. There was a whole bunch of us here. And I had to be like this. <laughs> and when I came home, my godmother, I had to report to her what the priest had to say, when mass was, for who, and everything else. First time, I didn't know, so she grabbed you by the ear. She said, you go to church, you'll listen, you understand? <laughs> and so, Maxie can tell you, when Father Ferris was here, I'd have to tell him. He would know, uh, tell him what it was. He'd say, I'll go stick. He says, you tell him. And they like to rig by deck. He would never answer, he'd always have the answer. I had to have it. <laughs> Is there anybody else that remembers the remember sermon? Remember the first one was great. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, no. I know. We had a choir. I sang in the choir. And I was in the choir. Was there a piano here? 
I remember the organ. Yeah, there was an organ. Yeah. There was a piano over here, but it sat it in the back. Nobody ever used it. The piano was there. Nobody used it. It was there all the time. And that side was the altar. I remember when there weren't any more services, the organ and the altar were here for quite a long time afterwards, and we tried to get a hold of whoever to, to come and get them. Uh, but it was a couple years at least, I think, until they were gone. <coughs> Is there a, anybody that went to school here? I know there are a lot of you who went to school here. What can you remember that you want to do all about? I went to school here in first grade only, and I may be the only student ever transferred out of here. <laughs> <laughs> there were 13 in my class, 12 boys, <laughs> and me, and we were separated at recess, <laughs> and I refused to accept that, <laughs> so I kept running out and joining their activities. And because I was such a problem, I was sent to the center of town to school. <laughs> Somebody else. I went to school here, and uh, in my classes, I'm very Russell. <laughs> and I come over here, and I say, oh, this is a crap. <laughs> so I was on the same class, and uh, class of 22 to 30. And tonight has been an eye opener. I'm not thinking, escape my mind, and I'm back to my memory. I do have one memory from the first grade. It's quite outstanding. I'm a die-hard left-hander, and I insisted on trying to write with my left hand and t shirts right hand. So consequently, I'm not scared when he's handy. An old ruler come down from the back of the room, and I guess uh, I wish I had made the other things. There's no people <laughs> That was John Hibbert. He, uh, he and I were the only two people who weren't Polish in, the, in my class. <laughs> it was a small class. I think we were what, about 12, 12 of us or so. We used to go swimming down the point, which is just opposite from your house. If you had to go across the lot, a couple of meadow street right through the, over your yard, and swim at the point. You must remember that. Mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> I used to swim there too. <laughs> in a in a one of those long black bathing suits <laughs> with white trim. <laughs> One more time. This is the way it was. The boys didn't have any bathing suits, so the girls would wait to jump in and we'd stay in the water. <laughs> I know some some of the people who some of the people probably in the 1890s or so uh, I've heard tell. Uh, that when they went to school here at recess, they uh, in the winter, they would go uh, get their skates and go across the ice, which is right behind here, you know, uh, go across the ice over to what they call the old pine tree, which was part way up the mountain in the pasture, really, uh, during recess, and go up there and walk, walk, I suppose, with their skates on, up to the old pine tree and back down across the ice again and try to get here in time to go back to school. Uh, I heard quite a lot of people did that, too. Well, always boys, of course. <laughs> Anybody else? Who, who owned the land before the school was built on? 
That's a good question. Uh, this was part of that mill lot, which, uh, and it, uh, the, the houses in this section are sometimes hard to uh, find who owned them and so forth. But after a while, the, well, the lawyers got into it too, but uh, they, uh, people who ho held leases for the land uh, in this area and also in the, con uh, on the, in the meadows, the people could buy the land that they had used and be par been part of. So, of course, uh, the town bought this for a house, for a school. Uh, the, the ball field belonged to the man across the street, which was Lorenzo, Lorenzo what? Yeah. And uh, so he, uh, I guess, gave the land to the town for the school. Any other good questions? Yes? Yeah, I went to school here grade one through six was also an altar boy here, and one of the fond memories is the fact that I had here Mr. Wallace for five out of the six grades is one one of the most teachers teachers oh, people I've ever 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 come in contact with. She has such tremendous patience with us. And, you know, the fond memories are of course playing ball out here all the time and and some of the mischievous things like trying to catching pigeons up in the belfry and breaking the window in the congregational church. <laughs> but certainly the memories were fun until the sixth grade and then when uh, we went to the uh, Russell School in Hadley and they told us the bar they told them the barbarians were coming though. <laughs> and I finally figured out why we were uh, perceived that way because we, we probably uh, sniff too much lead paint and <laughs> came in contact with too many pigeon droppings and <laughs> swam in the polluted North Abbey Park. Thanks. Who else? And we thought we knew how to swim once we learned to do the dog paddles. <laughs> Here we go, brother. <laughs> it's okay. You have a lot to offer. That's fine. One of the nice people in town that uh, I think uh, Mr. Espinosa might talk was Francis Drake. Oh, what, yeah. 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 Minister. Yeah. what a wonderful memory I have of that man. He was minister of uh, our North. Yeah. I, I believe. I believe he had, as well. There was uh, Drake that went to, uh, across America to Washington. He was a relative of his. I'm not sure. But what a beautiful person he was. And at uh, uh, Memorial Day, you spoke about Memorial Day. We all went out and we got daffodils and all that. And we picked flowers up and on Memorial Day. I remember this Mr. Scott, I forget what his first name, he had that uh, Civil War uniform that he wore. And we used to go to the uh, cemetery in North Abbey and place flowers on that. And Mr. Drake, uh, uh, Reverend Drake would come and sit there and we go. So that was our oh. Memorial Day remembrance. Gracious course, Peter. The book that I, uh, as I was reading oh, one book, I read this. Huh? Tell you the one book that I read, mainly Gracious read. Peter. Now, I remember Clarence Hawks was blind. Mm -hmm. And uh, he used to come to ball games. So can you imagine a bl blind man watching us play? Well, let's play ball baseball. He knew when the man had a hit and when he didn't. And one of his books that I did read that he wrote was Hitting the Dark Trail. So that's why I said that was a Dart Hadley library. Yeah. Yes. That was his autobiography. Yeah, you remember that. He was, he was a blind author. Uh, I think it's about time if there's nobody else that wants to talk. I hope everybody has had a chance to look at the pictures uh, and look at all the things up in the back there. Uh, and we're going to have ice cream. 
on this table up front. Uh, you'll have to eat it in your seats, but uh, it'll be up here.